this morning. The reading is, as Simon said, from Colossians 3, verses 18 to 25, and I'll be reading from the NIV version. So this passage is titled, Instructions for Christian Households. (coughs) Wives, submit yourselves to your husbands as is fitting in the Lord. Husbands, love your wives and do not be harsh with them. Children, obey your parents in everything, for this pleases the Lord. Fathers, do not embitter your children, or they will become discouraged. Slaves, obey your earthly masters in everything, and do it not only when their eye is on you and to carry their favour, but with sincerity of heart and reverence for the Lord. Whatever you do, work at it with all your heart, as working for the Lord, not for human masters, since you know that you will receive an inheritance from the Lord as a reward. It is the Lord Christ you are serving. Anyone who does wrong will be repaid for their wrongs, and there is no favoritism. Okay, good. Well, we are now in part 13 of our study in Colossians, which we call Colossal because of the great truths found in it. And we're on family matters at the moment, and last week it was uh, marriage. This week it's dads and kids. There's one big, big reason, isn't there? I heard it on the news actually this morning they were talking about it. One big reason that society is in a mess is the destruction of the nuclear family, what's called the nuclear family, the one that God instituted, that God created. And the redefinition of family according to this world that we're all too familiar with at the moment. But God's creation of family is a married biological male father from the beginning and a biological female mother who then go forth and multiply, in other words, have kids. God designed it in the beginning to be a safe place where children could trust their parents and be secure in the love that their parents had for them. Some of us have been privileged to be grown up like this. Many of us haven't. But family in God's eyes was little society to raise the next generation to be stable and secure and well-rounded members of the big society. But then sin, as we saw at the beginning and last week, at the beginning of uh, when sin first entered the world, it entered the human heart and replaced straight away the love of God for God and for others with self. And life became fundamentally all about me and mine. We see it everywhere. And when selfish, sinful people have kids, what happens? Kids follow their example. Uh, We go back to Genesis 4. Uh, You don't have to turn to it. I'm not really going to be in it for very long. But the first humans created have a son, and his name is Cain. And he grows up, and one day, in a fit of rage, he kills his brother, who was called Abel. It was the first murder of many more to come, sadly. It was driven by rivalry and jealousy and envy and hate and murderous fury and total lack of control. Why? Because Cain's offering to God was rejected, but Abel's wasn't. Sibling rivalry, if you like. You know, you often hear, don't you, especially on the films and the movies and uh, the episodes, uh, the the. I don't know, you know, on TV, such, or, or even on the news, such and such isn't capable of murder. But you see, since sin entered the heart of humanity, anyone is capable of anything. 
Jesus says, for out of the heart come evil thoughts, murder, adultery, sexual immorality, theft, false testimony, slander. He also says, you have heard that it was said to the people long ago, do not murder. And anyone who murders will be subject to judgment. But I tell you that anyone who is angry with his brother will be subject to judgment. What's Jesus saying? He's saying harboring unrighteous anger in our hearts is a, like a heart murder. That's where it begins. It's the beginnings of what could end up as physical murder. In other words, unchecked anger in your heart, if it's unchecked, will eventually lead to physical murder. So he's saying anger in the heart, as it rises, must be dealt with because it's potentially incredibly dangerous. And using that brother Cain as an example of how hatred and anger and jealousy, which started in the heart, can lead to physical murder, John says, 1 John 3, 15, anyone who hates his brother is a murderer. You see, unrighteous anger in your heart is the beginning of what could end up as physical murder. Everyone's capable of it, depends whether you check it and deal with it or not. However, some people misinterpret this. Murdering someone in your heart is not the same as going and murdering somebody. Because that's just making one sin on top of another on top of another. Adding sin to sin. Jesus is saying sin begins in the heart and if it's not crucified, if it's not stabbed to death, if it's not nipped in the bud, it can lead to even more sin and destruction. So the point is that when sin entered the heart in our first parents, God's original design for family suddenly was under threat. And the very first family God intended for good and the good of society ended up broken. And the rest, as they say, is history. But the great thing is that God doesn't leave it there. He saves he turns people around, he transforms, he gives them a new nature, a new heart, a one that does desire to be like him and to love him and therefore to love one another like him. And more than that, not just the new nature, God himself comes to live in the core of your heart, your human being, where you are, where all the decisions in your life are made. And the governance of your life is. And when he comes and lives in there by the Holy Spirit, he brings an empowerment and he prompts and he enables and he renews and he is changing you and he is ruling you should you allow him. And part of that in his heart, he gives you all the equipment to restore the broken family. To turn it around, to bring family back to what he created it to be. So all is not lost. We did marriage last week. Not that you can just do marriage in one sermon and then be done with it, but <laughs> still, it's a complex thing, marriage, isn't it? <laughs> um, and now we're on children and then fathers and or parents, but we're mainly fathers but parents. Well, children. Verse 20 that uh, Danella read to us. Children, obey your parents in everything, for this pleases the Lord. Now, this is written to a church in Colossae. That's why it's called Colossians. And it's written to Christians. And the assumption is that both parents, they might not all be, but generally speaking, both parents are still together. They're serving the Lord. They're living for him. And they're loving one another. So, in other words... The first verses, are, um, uh, 18 and 19 earlier, uh, follow on. So they're treating each other right, and it follows on to their kids. And it's also written to encourage the children in the Middle East and in Africa and all sorts of other places, and even now, the whole family is present for the whole service quite often. And it's a whole day out. So, and yet that's true now in Africa as well. And yes, the kids have their classes, but often they're there for the preaching as well. And they're incredibly well behaved. Anyway, 
It's written to encourage kids also to keep on being obedient to their parents because obedience pleases the Lord. And if the kids aren't respecting or doing what loving parents are asking them to do, then they, it's an encouragement for them to show their love for their parents and the Lord by obeying again and coming back to that place. Just a few words about this. Kids shouldn't knowingly, and I say knowingly, follow their parents into sin if they know it's wrong. Now, that's really tricky for a kid. Verse 20, children, obey your parents in everything, for this pleases the Lord. But the context, as we've seen earlier, kids obeying everything is assuming that the parents are also obeying the Lord and treating each other right, verse 18 and 19. And it's out of that example that kids are told to obey everything that their parents say. In other words, does a kid who knowingly follows their parents into sin please the Lord? I mean, when they know it's wrong. Of course not. But the thing is, kids from tiny get taught right and wrong from their parents or their guardians or whoever they are. And if those guardians and parents are wrong... Is that the kid's fault? No, of course it isn't the kid's fault. And put it this way as well. Does God really want kids to steal, to lie, to fight, to be subject to being abused and beaten and neglected and mistreated and damaged at the hand of their parents? Of course he doesn't. It's abhorrent to him. Nevertheless, when parents' eyes are off the Lord... Sin begins to reign again. And when your parents, when your parents play up, <laughs> and they do, when your kids play up, anger can fill the heart again. Unrighteous anger. And it has a devastating impact on the kids. And some of us are walking wounded because of that. Little six-year-old Arthur Labinjo Hughes was filmed before he died saying, I just want someone to love me. And then he was abused and murdered by his stepmother and assisted by his own father. Bless those people who pull people and kids out of abusive situations. We have some here. We have a charity here that does that, Whispers of Hope. Those who rescue mums and kids from severe harm and potential death God is with you. God, that is what God loves to see. Bless those who foster or care for or work with or pray for or adopt or uh, broken and damaged kids and instead they seek to love them and value them and protect them and through the power of Christ transform them so healing can be begin in their little lives and God to be can begin to undo some of the deep-seated damage that's in their lives. Because God is into restoration, to making new, to reversing the effects of sin. There is always hope in Jesus. He came, didn't he, to rescue, including those who are abused. And he can even transform the heart of the abuser and turn that heart towards himself. It's not only possible, but it's realistic to expect God if you're a Christian here this morning, to begin exposing and dealing with and restoring damage done, however deep it is in you or your kids that may well have grown up now. The healing process begins now. When I got saved years and years ago, I was so screwed up so broken, so damaged, so shy, so insecure. I couldn't be hide behind alcohol anymore because the Lord had removed that. There was nothing on board but the Lord. I like that. I made that one up. Nothing on board but the Lord. But my experience, I remember it vividly, was I kind of woke up a 13-year-old boy in a 25-year-old body, terrified of life paralyzed at the thought of the next five minutes of life. I just didn't know how to live in the real world since 13. And then I read this in the scriptures from Joel 2.25. 
and I will restore to you the years the locusts have eaten. Whoa! And it hit me like a sledgehammer. And there was hope. So I looked to Jesus just to get me through the next five minutes. I remember praying, Lord, get me through the next five, and then the next five. And it was literally one foot in front of the other, and literally total dependence on him for every second that I lived. I was like that little toddler who's learning to walk, and and he he falls, and, and he falls down. He looks up, but his father, loving father, God the Father, is smiling, not condemning, holds his hand out, helps him back up again, and he walks a bit further. Then he goes down, and the same thing happens. And the father's saying, no, you can do this. We'll have you walking. And those five minutes became 10 minutes, 20 minutes. Then it was a day. Then it was a week. Then it was a month. God slowly put me back together again. I will restore to you the years the locusts have eaten. And the other thing that's wonderful, and it's true of all of us to a certain degree, God was planning your rescue long before you ever knew him. This is what God is saying to his beloved Israel who were um, very, very rebellious towards him. But this is what he was saying. He's planning his rescue long before he knew. Apply this to yourself because it's God to his people. Ezekiel 16, 4, very moving passage. On the day you were born, your cord was not cut, nor were you washed with water to make you clean, nor were you rubbed with salt or wrapped in cloths. No one looked on you with pity or had compassion enough to do any of these things for you. Rather, you were thrown out into the open field, and from the day you were born, you were despised. That's some, of our, that's some of our background. Then I, says the Lord, passed by and saw you, kicking about in your blood. And as you lay there in your blood, I said to you, live. I made you grow like a plant of the field. You grew up and developed and became the most beautiful of jewels. Your breasts were formed and your hair grew you who were naked and bare. And then this, later I passed by and when I looked at you and saw that you were old enough for love, I spread the corner of my garment over you and covered your nakedness. I gave you my solemn oath and entered into a binding agreement with you, declares the Sovereign Lord, and you became mine. If you're a Christian, that's basically what happens spiritually to you. And it may have even happened physically to you, depending on your background. But you are now his. And he knew it all along. He saw it all along. And he was planning a time where he's going to pluck you out, rescue you, and turn you around. So let me issue this. Come to Jesus afresh this morning. Trust him. He's waiting to forgive. He's waiting to heal. He's waiting to transform and deliver and empower. But follow him. The Bible says I can do everything through him who gives me strength. I can't do anything on my own. In our Christian Alcoholics Anonymous recovery group, which is very Christ-centered, which is what it originally was and very powerful at that time and has been powerful for us. Here's a quote from what they call the old timers, those who had been through it and learned things. But it's relevant to all of us. Hurtful, traumatic things happen that we did not cause. And we learn to respond with patience, forgiveness and love. We recognize our part in relationships and we no longer need to control and be right in order to survive. The Lord invites us to grow up, to learn new living skills, to make amends, to connect with God, to carry the message for the benefit of ourselves and others. Though we have adopted a new lifestyle in Christ, we lived with our defects for a long time. And as the healing takes effect, the old habits will drop away. 
What about for those who are struggling as teens? Wow, that is such a hard time of life, isn't it? I think it's probably worse for you like now with social media and all the other stuff that's available to you. For those who struggle now as teens and for adults who are still working through what happened to them when they were kids, be encouraged because God loves you and he longs to heal you. But it's a process. Trust him as you take each step. But you've got to start walking. Someone said this, sometimes God will allow you to go through difficult things so that you can see him do impossible things. That's right. So that's kids. And now we come to fathers, dads. But we're going to include a bit of parents in general as well. Verse 21, fathers, do not embitter your children or they'll become discouraged. Now, parenting isn't easy. There is no perfect parent. Our parents made mistakes. If you're a parent, you've made mistakes, and I have. And no one teaches you to be a parent. It kind of just happens, and you think, what? And some things work for some parents, but all parents and kids are different and unique in their own way. But the thing is this, that the Lord is the perfect parent, and he calls himself Father. And just like he tells husbands to love their wives in Ephesians, we saw that last week, he tells husbands to love their wives as Christ loves the church, which is such a staggering thing. He also instructs fathers to be like their heavenly father. Before I had kids, I knew something of God's fatherly love to me. We all do, don't we? I'm not saying you have to have kids before you know that, not at all. But when I did become a father, I could see his love even more clearly. And I wanted to love my kids like he loved his, including me. And all of that is impossible without his help and power and wisdom and strength. And some of us have botched a big time. And some of us have done okay, but not ever. And some of us have been okay, pretty good, but we've all failed. And you see, fathers can embitter, or as Ephesians says, exasperate their children. But in two ways, that's all I've picked out. There's so much more to say on this, but we can't. The first way you can exasperate or embitter, discourage your children is by being physically or emotionally absent because this discourages the child. A child from the word go needs acceptance and love and affirmation from the mother and the father. They, don't not, they not only need to hear you say that you love them, but to show your love by how you treat them. Words are nothing unless they're backed up by actions. Fathers can embitter their kids by being too laid back and horizontal and really not taking much of an interest and giving the impression that their children are just a nuisance and we're just kind of putting up with you until you get a bit older and you get more of a brain <laughs> and you get more polite. Dad and mum, give them the attention they need if you've still got that opportunity. Or if you're thinking of get having kids, or thinking of getting married, whatever. Or you've already got young kids. Give them the attention they need. When a boy is tiny, his dad is the primary example of who and what a male is, and eventually what a father is. And that boy will be heavily influenced by his dad, even if his dad isn't a good dad, the boy somehow still thinks he's a hero and still longs to be loved by him, even though he may think that his dad doesn't love him. His, his, <laughs> his, his greatest desire is that my dad will love me. And sometimes some of us don't get that. Daughters, too, they look to their father who gives security and protection and nurture, who isn't easily angered and goes off the handle, but he's gentle and kind. He's a gentle giant, if you like. 
because he has strength, but he doesn't use it or abuse it. And they form their views of boys and men first by looking at their dad, because that's all, all the example they've got. And there are so many single-parent families now, which is what we're saying about the destruction of the nuclear family. And usually dad doesn't get permanent custody of the kids, though sometimes he does, and sometimes it can be shared. But if that's generally the case, and, and, and you're a dad here that, that uh, doesn't have permanent custody of your kids, but you have access, make sure you're around them as much as you can be. And supposing your dad isn't around, other Christian dads that can be trusted can help. Park, our sister church, starting a group for boys whose dads aren't around much because the issue there is that they're with their mums but their dads have cleared up. So the dads who are around and they're good dads to their own kids will team up with other kids that need a good dad role model in their life. Now, that's a really good thing. And through activities, they help father the other kids, give them a male role model that they can trust and look up to. It's a lads and dads group. To avoid any problems, no one dad is left alone with the child. It's a group thing. But it's a very good thing. And it just reminded me, I thought, well, how about us here? Hope boys and girls. Those who don't have a dad around. Could some of us dads who can be trusted do the same and help where help is needed? Because people need, and actually you don't even have to be a physical, biological dad. You can just be a trusted, good male role model. But we need dads in this country. We need men in this country who, as well because... They've been crushed and, and, and trampled down in so many ways that things have gone the other way. Of course, equality, but things have gone too far the other way sometimes. Did you know that the most disadvantaged person in our society now is a white, working-class, heterosexual male? It never used to be that. But it's true. Christians are one body. We should be there for one another, including the kids, obviously with the right safeguards. But we can help one another. I went to a church once where, and I don't think it's necessarily biblical, but it's a good idea. When their child came to the church, the baby, and they wanted to give thanks to the Lord for it, but not baptize it, but just sort of the parents promised to raise that child in the ways of the Lord. The congregation all, say, all said, and we will help. I think that's a good thing. So, the first way in which uh, dads can embitter their children is by being either physically or emotionally absent. And the second way they can embitter their children is by being there, but being overly unreasonably or strict. Overly unreasonable or strict. Uh, verse 21 of our passage. Fathers, do not embitter your children or they will become discouraged. See, one dad we've just talked about is too laid back or he's absent, and the other is present but unreasonable. Ephesians 6.4 is a parallel passage. It says, fathers, do not exasperate, and you know what that means? Enrage or incense or wind up your kids. And the other thing is, an angry dad causes their kids to be angry. They copy. Plus mistreatment and winding them up and annoying them discourages them. So it says, do, fathers, do not exasperate in rage and sense wind up your children. Instead, bring them up in the training and instruction of the Lord. Now, all kids need boundaries. It shows care and it shows love. It protects them from themselves and potential danger. Just like God gives us commands, they're to protect us and to keep us safe. And it's a token of his love for us. Now, little Zach, my son, he's 23 now, but when he was three, <laughs> or whatever, he kept running towards the fire, don't they all, as soon as they see a flame when, when they're tiny, we are running towards it, and we go, no, no, it's hot, it's hot, get away from it. And you have to put your body on the line, because he was going for it, he was totally unaware of the danger. Whatever you told him, 
As soon as you took your eye off him, there he was, just about to put his hand in the flame, still going towards the flame. So in the end, I put up a fire guard, massive thing, and bolted it either side to the wall to stop him getting burned. He thought this was a bad thing. So the next thing, he's pulling at the fire. I could hear the shake. He's pulling at the fire guard, rattling it loose from the wall. I'm saying, no, Zach, no. <laughs> Now, he didn't like it. He hated the boundaries. He hated doing what I asked him to do. But any good father would keep their child from harm. That's reasonable. That's necessary. That shows love and care and protection. We don't raise our kids, friends, according to this world or our own ideas. We bring them up in the training and instruction of the Lord. It's the best bringing up they could ever have. Just as the Lord is raising us, spiritually, to be his children. So sons and daughters need discipline, but make sure it's reasonable and protective and it would be something that the Lord would do. And then this, fathers and parents are to show kids what God is like by their parenting. And this is another huge challenge. If you parent like the father parents, they come to know who God really is. Because they can see him, the likeness of the father in you. And just like the father, God, lavishes his love on his children, you do likewise with your children. You tell them that you love them. And some of us came from backgrounds where, and it was kind of a culture as well, your, your dad and your mum never told you they loved you. And uh, you never said you loved them either. And it became incredibly awkward if you ever did. So when I had kids, I thought, I'm not doing that. From the beginning, I'm going to tell them I love them. I'm going to tell them I love them quite often. And even when they ring up sometimes, I'll say, love you, before we put the phone on. Some, some families do that really well. Other families don't do it at all. But you've got to say it, say it sometimes, and then you've got to do it. You've got to lavish your love on your kids and tell them how, and show them how much they love them, just like the Father God does with us. And it trains them in who and what God is and what he says and what he does. Because, you see, if you've had a really stern, strict, unreasonable dad, as many of us had, and they may be religious, they may be pastors, whatever, your view of the heavenly father is that he's stern, he's strict, he'll knock you down, and you've got to jump through this hoop before you get, get his love, and you've got to do that. No, 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 that is so wrong. That is not how the heavenly father is. So whoever your father was, whether he was a monster or whether he was a saint, they all fall far, far short from the real heavenly father. He's the one we ultimately look to for our security. And then fathers are to show kids what's, what God is like by the parenting. By delighting in them and rejoicing over them. Um, we have this wonderful picture, don't we? Zephaniah. Uh, I think it says Zep there. Is there any metal fans out there? Zep. I thought, I don't think Led Zeppelin would ever say delight in your kids and rejoice over them. Some of you know what I'm talking about. Some of you don't. Um, anyway. Uh, the Lord your God is with you, we read. He is mighty to save. He will take great delight in you. This is God looking at you. Israel originally. He will quiet you, stop you worrying, calm you down with his love. He will rejoice over you with singing. Did you know that God sings over you? It's a bit like there's a picture of a, a little baby, isn't there, in the, in the father's arms. And you're looking into their eyes. I've done it with my kids. And you start cooing and singing, make a bit of a fool of yourself and speaking sweet nothings into them. And uh, it's just like that with the baby. And God is saying, that's how I feel about you. Now be like that to your kids. It's very powerful. God doesn't reward failure and neither should parents. But he does teach us how to learn from failure in order to succeed. And that failure is a necessary part of getting there in the end. So that we lose graciously and we win humbly. And we give him the glory in both. Praise your kids when they do good. And you know what? Here comes the body of Christ again. If you were never praised as a kid, I wasn't. If you were never praised as a kid, then let's encourage one another as the body of Christ. When someone does something really kind, 
Say how much you appreciate it. Some people have never heard that. They can hear it here. Praise them when they do, God. Tell them you're proud of them. Oh, if only <laughs> I'd have heard that. <laughs> I'm sure some of you have not heard that either. But other people have told me that. And God has told me that. Spend quality time with them. Listen to them without interrupting. Understand where they're coming from. And this goes for young kids here as well. If they, come, if they trust you with something and you're not their parent, just try and understand where they're coming from. Don't be judgmental. Don't be afraid too, to own up to your mistakes in parenting and say sorry to your kids if you need to. I spent a lot of time doing that. <laughs> Create a loving but protective, safe environment so they can come to tell you what's bothering them. And that goes for our young people here as well. Learn to be unshockable. Because if you say something, if your kid tells you something and you go, oh, that's terrible. <laughs> and we do, you know, oh, how could my boy do that? And all that sort of thing. They're not going to come to you again. Let me tell you, they'll find somebody else and they might not be the right people. Share relevant things from your past, things you did when you were their age that might help them know you've been there. Now, kids can't really imagine their parents were ever kids, can they? My uh, daughter yesterday, she was saying about something that happened in 1965. Uh, and they were saying, that's miles, I mean, that, that's so old. And she said, well, my dad was three at that time. I thought... Please, why did you have to tell them that? <laughs> they can't imagine you were ever a kid. They always think you were old. You were kind of born old. But with kids, as they get older, and you being a kid, you would know as well, as you get older, you take less notice of your parents and more notice of your friends, and that's where the problem really starts in if you've come from a good home. So you must get in there. If you've got the opportunity, some of you have, you must get in there early. The Jesuit said this, give me the boy until he's seven and I will show you the man. Formative years, teachers talk about it all the time. They're like sponges. You get all the goodness in. If, if you've lost that chance, fine. But you get all the goodness into them till they're seven. And that's what they're going to hang on to. Bible says... Uh, I have known this, you have known the scriptures from infancy, God's word, that is able to make you wise to salvation later on. That's what happened to me. I was taught it. I hated it. Later on, God up uploaded it when I was 25 and wallop. That was it. It's worth teaching your kids things about Jesus. It sits there in your hard drive. And parents, if you're disciplining your kids, don't go over the top. And we all have. But don't lash, lash out in anger on the spur of the moment. Go away and calm down. This is hard stuff. Don't say or do something you'll regret. Let kids know that you love them as they are, but too much to leave them as they are. I know that's the cliche about God, but also about parents. So many kids that I've spoken to that are now adults thought that they'd have to jump through this hoop and do that thing before their parents would love them. And that's tragic. In many ways, that's my testimony. And so you don't feel loved for who you are. You feel loved for what you do. So you keep doing and doing, and yet sometimes the hoops get further and further away because some parents can never be pleased with you. But God the Father loves you as you are. Remember that. Not as you should be. Starting point as you are. But in his great love, he will move you to where you should be because he cares. Give your kids, if you can, give them that same message. All this is so hard, isn't it? It's so tough. I've been a parent. My kids have grown up. I have regrets. Of course I do. But you know what? you just got to keep coming back to Jesus because every time you come back to Jesus, that is wiped clean. And some of us can seek to begin to undo the damage we've done, talk through the damage we've done as parents to our children. But if we can't, sometimes we can write something. And if they're dead, then we can just confess it all to the Lord. He wipes it away 
and put, pour out your heart to him. He's your heavenly father. He's always there. He loves you as you are, not as you should be. And if you're still struggling with it, share some of those issues with someone you trust. And if your parent or your child is still alive, but the other person doesn't want to sort things out, all you can do is try your very best and then leave the rest with the Lord. And you just have to let it go. You just have to. You can't torture yourself for the rest of your life if you've made the effort and the other person hasn't come to the table or hasn't cooperated. What more can you do? Always, though, always, no matter who your dad was, default to the Heavenly Father and his love for you and love your kids if you get that chance. I used to tell my kids very early on, just because I learned these things early on in, in my own childhood, I used to say, you've got two dads, and they get quite confused. They think, what? You, 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 what do you mean, two dads? Well, the other one's much better than me. And when I'm gone, he'll still be here. And you need to look to him first, because I'm flawed. I make loads of mistakes. I'm an idiot. I sometimes lose my temper. Trust him. Go to him. Trust in the Heavenly Father. And you know where I've finished now, but when my... When I first became a Christian, I began to idolize my dad, even though we hadn't got on well at all. And um, I said at the time, when he dies, I die. But when he did die, a lot had gone on. And that was never the case, because I'd got to know my Heavenly Father. There's no way I was going to die just because my earthly father died. My hope was no longer in my dad. I didn't need to keep making up, making up, making up. I rested in Christ's love, the Heavenly Father's love, and I trusted him. And I'll tell you what, I got through that passing. I, it was sad, but I got through that passing rock solid. You know why? Because I never took my eyes off the real Heavenly Father, who was always going to be there for me. Remember that. Let's pray as our musicians come up. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for your word to us. It's hard. It's heartbreaking. It's difficult. Some of us have had good backgrounds. Some of us not so good. Some of us terrible. Some of us haven't had parents. Lord, whatever the state, we know that you are our Heavenly Father and you accept all who come to you through Jesus. And so we have new life. We have new chances. Our past can be wiped away. You're the judge at the end of the day and you remember our sins no more. And you can help us restore from the things that are done to us that weren't our fault. So Lord, help us, whatever state we're in, help us to pour out everything to you. The, uh, you say you are our counsellor. We pray that you would fill us with your spirit and help every single person here to know the hugeness of your love for them as they are and not as they should be. In Jesus' name, amen.